So here in Unity, you can animate 2D characters almost as effectively as you can in your native work environment. So if you want to make um, polygon objects and animate a 2D character inside of Maya, you could do that. Um, if you wanted to do a pixel animation and export a sprite sheet, you could do that. Um, but there's a certain kind of animation that is very efficient that works well for game development. And that is this sort of uh, puppet rig that I first learned uh, to use with Flash. And so what you do is you illustrate all of your pieces and sort of arrange them together and set their pivot points in such a way that you can animate the character with relatively few drawings and enough flexibility to accomplish um, the thing that you're trying to do. So for instance, this is a replacement sprite. I shouldn't have moved it, but there we go. A replacement sprite for the eyes. Um, I'm going to show you not how to set this up immediately, but sort of how to deal with the animation environment first. We're going to do an assignment where we animate this character according to parameters, and I show how all of that works. And then we're going to show how to set up a character from scratch. So first, let me look in the Assets folder down here. If you've not used Unity before, and that's kind of understandable at this point, it's uh, pretty easy to get the hang of it, but uh, this is just going to center around the artistic and specifically the animation side of things. If you want to fully uh, learn how to use the Unity environment, I suggest going to their Learn site and doing their Essentials series, which is really great. So down here at the bottom, I've got the Project view. And the Project view has a Asset folder and all of these subfolders. This is literally just the folder on the desktop that contains everything. And it's suggested by them that you don't go messing around on the desktop with that stuff, that you just deal with it within the project so that they can update um, all of the connections to various assets that exist within the project. Um, here we've got animations, art, materials, prefab, scenes, scripts. You don't have to know what all of those are, except that the animations here, these are recordings of the actions that the character can perform. And these other ones that look slightly different, the controllers, are ways to tell it when to perform those actions. So there's a few different semantic kind of definitions that are similar, and it can get a little bit confusing sometimes, but I'll go through all of it. So these are the actions, um, dot anim is what that says. And then the dot controller is the way we tell it to perform those actions in accordance with usually some scripting and some things that happen uh, in the scene. We've got the art folder, and this art folder contains a picture of our background. And then a few sheets that have special effects and pieces of animated stuff. And so this one in particular is the one that we're most interested in. This is the um, sprite sheet that makes up this character that we're viewing right here. Uh, you'll notice it's all broken up into pieces. And wherever something's going to overlap, there's enough art so that as you move something away, you're not going to see a gap. So if I, oh, that's the hinge, I need the jaw. So if I rotate this down, we can see existing mouth back there. Even if I moved or scaled it a little bit, we're not going to see just a gaping hole in the character all of a sudden. Uh, the same thing's kind of true for the secondary piece. You'll see why that exists in a moment. Um, it's hard to change perspective on a character. And so sometimes you need multiple drawings of the same sort of thing to make that work. Um, we'll go over all of the import settings when we're setting up our characters. But the main thing that you need to know is that here in the sprite editor, um, all of these different pieces are broken into their constituent parts. And we make sure that they don't include parts of other sprites like this. There's a way to do that effectively. And then we set our pivot point. So that's where it will hinge from when we're animating it in our scene. So for now, that's going to be sufficient for us to understand what's going on here. Let me go ahead and play this scene really quickly just to show what happens. So here's our character floating in this space. And you can see this is the scene view where we just have a camera that we can move anywhere we want. I'm going to switch over to the animator so that we can see as we get closer to this, he starts to change his actions. And over here, there's a graph that's sort of updating. As I move away, he goes back. So here he is, yellow eyes and you see his ears start to shake. He starts to look agitated. And then at this point, he starts snapping. And if I move away, then he goes back to his default state. So we have two different windows in Unity that are named very similarly. We have the animator, 
we have the animation. Okay, the animator window is the one that shows a graph of behavior. The animation window will show our animations, the ones that the actions that we can perform, and gives us the ability to set keyframes and things like that. I don't know why they're named so semantically. I really wish that they were different. But here in Windows animation, you can see all three windows. Technically, there's three. The third one, parameter, is this right here. It's almost always docked with animator because you need these parameters. They're the ones that control the behavior. So watch this number distance as I move the character. You can see the distance is being measured between it and this object. And that's the thing that's driving the difference between these animations. So as I go farther away, he looks like this. As I get closer, he starts to look like this until a certain point when it transfers over to this other action attacking. Okay. For a slightly closer look, you can see that this one is orange and there's this sort of play going over and over and over. These are uh, animation loops that are being performed right now. But if I double click on this, we go inside of that and we can see that this is called a blend tree. This blend tree takes a parameter like distance and it sort of blurs between these two different states. So I've got two animations that are very similar, but can sort of be played at the same time. And so halfway between the distances that will fully uh, make one of these clips active, we've got sort of orange eyes and a little bit of ear shake and a little bit faster beeping. Over here, we've got a slower beep, no ears tremoring and yellow eyes. So I get very close. We're almost purely playing one of the two clips. When I go past this limit, nothing's really happening here. That's happening over here where we've got transitions. These transitions can have conditions. So when this distance is less than five, it's going to go to this next action. Over on this side, when this distance is greater than five, it'll go back to the previous action. So if I go ahead and trigger that, you can see that it does a transition and then it plays this effect. The ability to set clips that make sense in this context and the ability to set uh, transitions which are pleasant to see and make sense in the context of the game is a lot of the skill of animation within Unity. Um, it's not just performing the actions, but it's hooking them all up to appropriately behave uh, according to how the, the characters can uh, reckon when they should change their behavior. Um, these parameters, by the way, like distance, need to be exposed in a script. And so if you are a tech-savvy animator, you can write scripts that report things from the characters to your animator um, or your animation controller, which is a very, very big asset on a production. If you're not, then you have to ask a programmer to do it for you and sort of explain to them exactly what sort of behaviors you're looking for and what sort of parameters you want to be exposed. For instance, you can um, keep track of when an object hits another, when it enters a certain area, like a trigger collider. You can measure velocities, directions, distance, and player input. So right now, this is very simple. It's just a distance, but I could be measuring when I'm pressing the left and right keys. I could be measuring when I touch something as opposed to when I just get nearby it. All of those things are possible. So I'm going to stop that playback real quick. Down here, and I need to show the hierarchy. Let's look at the scene view because it's closer up. The hierarchy is another um, common part of Unity in which you can just see everything that's in the scene. This is the character, and these are the components in the inspector that are attached to the character, things that make them work. So we've got a transform is typical to have on everything. The name is up here. A rigid body 2D, this is just saying that it is physics driven, as in it can have a solid collision uh, happen with it. It can overlap other colliders. Sometimes we can give it gravity or we can give it inertia. And so this ball shape here is the circle collider. So all of that stuff together, the transform, the rigid body, the circle collider, is what makes up the function of this character. Underneath that, I have an object called sprites, ball robot spite, sprites. It has an animator, which is the component that communicates with this bit of logic. And it's got a script, which is reporting things to it. Everything else underneath that are the individual parts that make up the puppet that makes it look the way it does. But there's no physical interaction beyond this first object. Everything down here is, is just visual and aesthetic. Okay. Once I've selected this, you can see down here we have some animations available that we can play. So in this window, 
you can find the, the familiar curves if you want to, um, and it works very much the same way as Maya. But with 2D animation, it tends to be a little bit more um, common that you just use the dope sheet, which is to say, here's time, and then this is a keyframe, and these are the parameters that keyframes are contained on. So it's just, did you key something or not as you move through this timeline? Uh, if I hit play, this is the idle animation for this ball, which is the one when he's not agitated. If I change to active, this is the animation that plays when he's very near something that he's about to snap at. And they take the same amount of time because they're meant to be blended between each other. They both are about, actually that one's two seconds. I never noticed that. I guess it works anyway. I did this a while back and so I can't remember the decision making necessarily. There's also some extra keyframes back here for some reason. Well, I'm not going to try to look into why I did what I did back then, but typically these would be the same length and I don't really know why that exists, but there might be a good reason. I'm just not sure. So those are the two animation clips that are currently playing. This one where he's going to bob that uh, jaw over and over again. I think I may have edited it after the fact to you know, chop at the right length or something. And then we've got attack. And this one is when he's actually snapping his teeth. So I'm going to pause this one and take a quick look. Here's the puppet as we saw it, but as it moves, we switch to this other version of the head. And there's also this other version of the jaw here. Just inadvertently deselected everything. Here we go. We'll play that. Oh, we got to switch back to attack. There we go. Okay. So I want to be able to select the right things and not have it disappear. But the jaw is changing sprite right at that moment there. So if I grab jaw, there we go. We can see the sprite is ball jaw B. That's the identity for it. And if I move back a little bit, we have jaw jaw A. Those are two different sprites and we can select them over in this menu. We've got this big long list. Here's jaw B and here's jaw A. You see that just turned pink because I changed a key. Okay. So sometimes you need to be able to swap things out into different uh, shapes, different perspectives, uh, different drawings entirely. A good example of that might be facial expressions or eye blinks. Uh, another one in this case is the head shape. So at the top here, um, we've got head and it changes from this forward looking head to this upward looking head to be able to open the jaw extra wide. And we can see that happening. There's other things that happen, such as eye color changing, uh, which is a sprite that is invisible until I turn it on, and also the snaps in front of the mouth. So we can see there's no snap, and then a snap appears here. Here I've got FX snap. And what's happening there is that the actual sprite renderer is being turned off and on, which is another thing that you can do to animate things inside of Unity. We have the ability to flip things as just a button, both left and right and up and down. We have the ability to change their sorting order if we wanted to. So you could have something go in front of and behind something during an animation. We can change the color. Um, we can change the transparency. So that's another great one where if I grab this, instead of a orange snap, we could make it green. Uh, we can also change the alpha down and up. And that is actually what is controlling the glow on this antenna. If I can find the hinge, the antenna, the glow. So throughout many of these animations, this glow is going off and on. It looks like in this one, it doesn't actually change. So I'll go back to idle because I know that it changes there. So here we've got keyframes that say for the color that it should be dimmer and brighter. So actually because of the material here, we didn't have to, to alter the transparency, but you could have done that. In this one, it's just making it darker and lighter because the material is a glow material that makes it more apparent when it's closer to white. And so in this case, you can just see the color going up and down from black to orange. But it's the same kind of principle. So that's sort of a, a basic overview of how animation works inside of Unity. We have these clips, which are saved in our asset folders. Every time we make an animation clip, one of these anims is saved. We have a controller, which is attached somehow to the object out here to tell it what to do and when. So there's the animator, okay? We have the physical characteristics which need to report their characteristics to the animator. So the animator takes that data and then feeds it into these either blend trees like this one, which you set up, 
or it feeds it into a transition that says, when you've passed this value, do this other thing. So that's kind of a broad overview of it. All we're going to be concerned for this uh, in assignment is animating existing clips, existing empty clips, to take advantage of parameters that I'm going to provide to you. In your assignment, the parameters are going to be different. This is just an example to show what is possible because this was already set up for me. So if I hit play one more time and move this character around, we can see all of that stuff is taking place. And if I show the animator once more, you can see the blend tree, blending, and then the transition taking place. So all those animations are playing at the right time. So here I have a blank animation for our robot. I have all of the appropriate channels already included in this animation. And that's the first important note to mention when animating within Unity. Initially, this is an empty list. And anything that you move when you hit this record button will be included on this list. So for instance, if I grab this object, which is the entire sprites object, and then just rotate, you can see that it was just added to the list there. But the problem is, if you're going to start blending animations together, and especially transitioning, you run the risk of something not being reset or not being set back to its initial state if it's not included on this list. For this assignment, you are going to be given uh, blank animation files that already have everything appropriate included. But if you want to be extra careful, you can select them on the list directly like this to always grab something that has animation associated with it. Or when you click on something, if you see that there are no pink channels, then that is not something that is currently being animated. So right here for the uh, ball head A, we can see all of the transform channels, position, rotation, and scale are animated, and the character sprite is animated. Uh, if I go to FX Glow, only the position and the color, I guess, is not animated in this one, but the color was often animated. It's probably down on the list somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is. It's just not able to be highlighted in the inspector. So you want to be careful about that. The way that we set keys in here is not very different from Maya. Let's just do a quick open and close of the jaw. So I'm going to grab the jaw, which is able to be open and closed here. I have this recording button depressed, which makes everything pink. That shows that changes will be recorded. Um, take a look at the timeline. Sometimes it can be very, very zoomed in where it looks a little bit different. We're not, we don't have frame numbers. We have time. Uh, the, the digit outside the colon represents seconds. So this is one second of animation. So if I come over here, then I want the jaw to be in and end in the same position. So I kind of have to set a key now. And that can be a little bit challenging because the keyboard shortcuts aren't the same. If we come down, we can see jaw rotation down here. This is the thing that we would want to key. You right click and do add key. Or if you change any of the rotations, we could right click up here and add key as well. And you can see it puts this little diamond shape on the timeline. So then if I move back to half a second, rotate this open. Now we should have an animation which opens, closes, open, closes. So if I hit play, <clears throat> that's what we get. Um, it's very easy to retime animation on this dope sheet um, and also copy and paste if you want to. So if we want this to chatter, open, close, open, close very quickly, I can move this back to 10. We'll move this to 20 and then I'll go ahead and copy. Let's copy the closed first. So just control C on the keyboard, move to the appropriate time and paste, move to the appropriate time and paste. You can see it's pasted the correct parameter. Then this is the open, copy, paste, paste. And so now we should have chattering, right? So it is starting closed, open once, closed twice, three times, okay? And if we wanted to add variation to that now, just because you know animation is a little bit boring if it's exactly the same thing, we can go to all the open positions and I'll close this one a little bit, maybe open this one a little bit more than it was, and then we'll have the third one, the widest one. So that'd be wide open like that. So now it'll be almost like he's talking or something. 
Okay. So that's how we set keys. Now, the important thing to note for animation loops and blending is that at the end of our clip, we really want to have every parameter keyed again so that we're guaranteed that it returned back to the state that it was formerly in. So for instance, if we had um, the eyes, which have alpha animated here, we'd have the eyes glow towards red in the middle of this. But then we might not necessarily ever change it back again. We might forget. If this was interrupted, this clip, and we started playing some other animation, then that value would just be the one that this object was set at unless something told it to be something else at the start of the next clip. And it might not necessarily. The easiest way to do that is to just click up here in this gray area where we've got these diamonds. These represent all keys at that current time. And we can just click that first one, hit copy, control C, go to the end of our clip and control V. If there was already keys at that time, they're gonna be overwritten. And so now we've got it changing to red and changing back to yellow. And if we were to blend this clip with something else, then it would transition back to its initial state before exiting this clip. So that can sometimes be an important thing to take into account. At this point, this clip, which uh, was called Robot Fast, I'm gonna deselect the keyframe recording. This was already in our asset folder in the animations. We've got uh, Robot Controller, which is the one that you're gonna use. Robot still, which will happen when the robot is not moving very fast. And then robot fast, which will happen when it's flying through the air. These clips are the ones that are saving our animation. And they're the ones that are communicating with the animation controller here. It will oftentimes create new um, nodes here, which we can just delete when you create clips on the fly. But these are all gonna be hooked up into this blend tree so that when the robot is still, it does one thing. When the robot is moving, it will do an another thing. And we've got a preview window down here, which I can actually play and then change the parameter to see how it blends between those two. Okay. So here is slow is the identical to my original one. I'm going to blank all of these out for you guys so that you can animate them properly. But then fast is just that. And so halfway between, it's doing both of those things. So that's how to do a little bit of animation within Unity. Um, I'll do a larger demonstration of animating something in particular uh, next. I'm going to show you how to open a new Unity scene and import the package that we'll be using for our assignment. Uh, when you have Unity Hub open, you're going to hit the New button. And that's going to give you a dialog box which prompts you to choose a template and name the project and choose a location. The template is going to be a 2D project. Uh, the name of the project, uh, you can name this whatever you like, because what we're going to actually turn in is another Unity package. But we'll just say that this is um, Ball Animation Project, something like that. And then choose the location that makes sense to you. I'm just going to put it on the desktop. That way, a folder with all of this contents will appear there. And hit Create. It can take a few minutes to create your project because it has to uh, import a lot of stuff. There is a progress window that's popped up on my other monitor over there that you can't see, but you'll be able to see yours. And then there's just a progress bar that will show you how long it's going to take. OK, so now that we have our project open, this is how our blank projects appear. Um, sample scene is always included. And so in your project uh, folder, you're going to have the sample scene already there. You can just ignore that. Don't have to worry about it. Find the package that you downloaded from Google Drive for assignment and just drag it right into the interface down into the project panel and then let go. It's going to prompt you to import all of this stuff. And this is everything that we need. You can see them organized into folders. So we've got animations with the controllers. Don't worry about the spring controllers and animations. Those are functioning already. You don't have to do anything to them. Our three animations that we're going to edit are right here. Uh, our art for our enemy, for our background, materials, prefab, scenes. You don't have to know what most of this stuff is, just that all of it is essential. So we're going to hit import. It's going to take a moment to import all of that to our project. And then once it's done that, we can open up the playground scene. So you have to go to the scenes folder, open up the playground scene, 
and then you should be able to see everything visible here in the main interface. I'm going to maximize again. For those of you new to Unity, be aware that there's two different primary views, uh, a game view in which you can't interact or do anything until you hit play, and then a scene view, which is intended to move around and edit things. It can be a little bit frustrating if you don't know the difference between those two, so just be aware that we are working in scene view most of the time and that you can select things in the hierarchy just by clicking on them. So that makes everything a little bit easier. So what you're going to do for the assignment in total is load up this scene, import that package, and then select the ball enemy, open up the um, hierarchy just by clicking this downward facing arrow, and select this second object, ball robot sprites. That will enable you to, in the animation window down here, uh, select each of the three clips that you need to edit. Remember that these windows, if they're not already visible in your interface, can be found in Windows, Animation, and then they are these two, Animation and Animator. Uh, animation parameter is almost always docked with the Animator, so you shouldn't have to worry about it, but these are where you find those two windows. And then if they are not docked somewhere convenient, sometimes they are just free floating, you can grab them by the tab and then see where they can sit inside of your interface. I like to dock the animator up here on the uh, central primary interface area and the animation down here by the project view. That just makes it the most convenient for me. Okay, so in our scene view, when we have this correct object selected, then we can view our three different animations. Um, probably start with the still one because that's our neutral. You can hit preview to see what it does, but currently it doesn't do anything. If you hit the record button, now we are making changes to this clip, as I demonstrated a little bit earlier. Uh, keep in mind that for the timeline here, it always starts out very small, but one represents one second. So once you've done your animation for all three of these clips, we'll assume that um, you did that. You should probably test it by hitting play at the top of the interface. Then you can move the ball around with the WASD keys or the arrow keys and once you hit something, you should see your hit animation trigger. As you're moving around, you should see it blend between your idle and your fast animations, but it won't get very much faster than that because really there's no room to. Don't worry about going outside the scene, by the way. There's boundaries set up so that you can't do that. When you're done testing, just hit the play button again, and now we're back into our editing mode. Uh, be aware that this pause button is different if you've never used Unity before. The pause button allows you to uh, stay in play mode, but momentarily halt the playback so that you can exert things. You don't need that for our purposes. Just use the play button to start and stop. All right. Once you're completely done with everything that you want to animate, you want to turn in your assignment. We're not actually going to turn in the entire projects and I don't want you to. I want you to export a package for me. So in the project view down here, and I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit smaller so I can put it up here when we're done. Go to the animations folder, and these are the three animation clips that you've been editing to do your project. Once it's playing back the, the nice way that you want it to, you're going to select these three files, Robot Fast, Robot Hit, Robot Still, right click and choose Export Package. Okay, It's going to try to include other things because Include Dependencies is always checked on by default. Uncheck that because what I'm going to do is just load up your three animation files in my already existing scene and play them one by one uh, using your changes only. And that'll make it very easy for me to delete the previous student's uh, animations, import the next student's animations, and it should be very quick and convenient. So just those three things, and it's okay that it includes the folder because that will put it into the correct location. Okay? Hit export, and then you're gonna save it to a location that makes sense for you. Desktop always works for me. And then you're going to name it with your last name, first name, homework four. And that will be what you turn into Google Drive for me. So now that that's complete over here, here's the file. And now that's the only thing that you're going to turn into me, this uh, exported package with those three animations included. So as the final part of this demo, I'm going to animate the three clips, but I'm going to animate them slightly nonsensically because I don't want everyone to just copy exactly what my choices were. So to be clear, I don't want you to do what was uh, shown in the first example because this uh, object is not even going to be 
expressing those same parameters. There's not going to be a distance and sort of an attack. But I want you to think about the three actions that you would like the character to perform. So once again, they are when the robot is just sitting there in space, then fast represents when you are moving the robot under your own power, but it is not going so fast as it's hit a bumper. And then the last one is just a measurement of speed that once you've passed that big threshold where you've definitely been bounced by a bumper, you can do a third thing. So if you want that to be calm and swift and then agitated, that would be fine. Or if you want this to be, I don't know, uh, normal, then dizzy, maybe for the hit, and then maybe recovering from dizziness or minor dizziness, any of those things would make sense. But like I said, I'm going to just animate something semi-nonsensical for this, just to show that it works. So I'm going to get one second visible. I hit the record button. Uh, I like to physically select things rather than just go through this list. But just keep in mind that anything with a pink field is OK to animate. So I'm going to grab, let's say, the jaw is the most obvious thing to animate on this character. So I think I'll go ahead and do that. We also want to make sure that whatever the start pose is, we try to end on that pose as well. So it's a good step first before you go in the timeline to just look at this first pose and decide if that's what you want um, for that clip. And you can start from a different position in your other clips because they'll blend between them. So for the calm state, how about I uh, rotate the ears forward? Oops, I want to move the entire guy. Let's see, where's my ears? Oh, I left the uh, animation editable mode because I deselected for a moment. I'm just going to re-click that again. Oh, it looks like I moved that ear outside of that mode. So I'm going to undo. There we go. Now I'm going to reselect it. There we go. So now I'm going to do the edits. I'll, I'll just select them in the hierarchy here. Makes it a little bit easier. So I'm going to rotate the ears forward for his starting position, just to make it different enough that we can see. And I'll leave the jaw closed. So that's fine. I'll click this keyframe that represents all of those uh, keyable uh, attributes. Hit Control C to copy. And then I'm going to go to one second and paste them. And then so we have something interesting. Look, that's Control V, by the way, just to paste. They are keyboard shortcuts for both. Um, right clicking, I don't see an option to copy or paste keys, so you have to use the keyboard shortcuts. So then just so we have something interesting in the middle here, I'll just like waggle his ears or something uh, while we're sitting here. So why don't you select, oh, that is the ear. Um, same uh, shortcut keys for uh, manipulating as in Maya. Uh, w, E, and R are move, rotate, and scale, respectively. Mostly for 2D characters, you typically rotate a lot, and you don't scale or move very much, but they can come into play sometimes. So I'm going to move the ears up like that, and then I'll move them back down, but maybe a different amount. Oh, see, I exited again. It can be very easy to accidentally click the wrong thing. There we go. So I'm going to move this ear just a little bit, and this ear very far down. We'll copy this pose, paste it right here. I'm going to move to the point in timeline, hit paste. And now let's just see if that does. Yeah, that's enough. OK, we don't really need to do very much for this clip, just we're proving that it works. So now I'm going to do the uh, fast, which is the self-controlled state. This would also be the recovery from being bounced. So it's in between those two extreme positions. So for this one, I'll just angle the ears back. So we're already in the uh, recording mode. I'm going to angle the ears back, both of them, <clears throat> like this. And I'll turn the eyes red by selecting this color. So here's the eye um, object. Select the color field and then move the alpha channel all the way up for red, all the way down for yellow. If you want to do other things like move and scale this, then that's fine. But that's how you get it to turn on and off. I think the reason I did that is because I wanted it to blend. If we just turn the sprite renderer on or off, they would pop on or off. So you could make it blink. Um, you know what? I'll make the blinking happen for the hit. That'll be kind of cool. Go um, red, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow really quick. So we're going to start it like this. And I'm also just because we probably need to do something with the jaw. 
I'll have the jaw open for this one, but like a medium, medium kind of open. So that's our whole starting pose. I'm going to copy this and paste it at one second. Here we go. And then give it the, the motion that I want in between. So I'm going to have the ears flutter a little bit more rapidly. Dang. There we go. Ball robot sprites. Select the correct one. Fast recording. I keep misclicking. I'm going to select the ear. I think, let me just recommend right now, click in the hierarchy, not on the object. It's just been a pain for me. So I can't imagine that it's going to be any easier for you if it is good for you. So I'm going to have the, the ears. Let's have them go different directions this time. Uh, oh, I'm still on my first pose. I actually need to change off of that. So I'm going to undo a couple times, then move up here. Now I'm going to make the change. So this one will go down. This one will go up. I'm going to copy that just so I can do this rapidly. I'm going to paste it every second step that I'm intending. And then for these other steps, I'm going to move them the opposite way. So this will go in. Oops, I've got both of them. This will go in. And then this one will go in. So they'll go in, out, in, out, in, out. Copy this. Paste it here. And now, OK, I mean, it's better. It's, it's a different effect. We got red eyes, and then I'll also have the jaw um, sort of chewing. So I'll have it just close so that it can close open slower than the ears. There we go. So that'll be our fast. So it should blend between those. Then finally, I'm going to choose the hit. And since this is a blend between um, slow and fast, I'm actually going to copy this first pose. I'm going to paste it as the very first thing I do in hit, just so that we start there. There we go. So we're going to start there. And I'm going to make this even more extreme. So we're going to actually let me change the first pose. I'm going to make the jaw open a bit wider. We'll have the eyes blinking on and off, but the ears, I won't really do anything. I'll just leave them flat back. And we'll just have the jaw rapidly chew and the eyes blink. That'll be my thing for this. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this at one second. You can have these clips different lengths, but it helps with the blending if they're all the same time frame. All right. So let me grab the jaw. And so I'm going to close it and open it. And I'm just going to kind of pick random positions. So it just has a, a kind of frenetic action. There we go. OK, so if I hit play, there we go. So he's kind of like talking. And then finally, I'll make the eyes blink on and off. I want this to be somewhat rapid. So right here, I'm going to select the eyes object. And I'll just turn the sprite renderer off. And then over here, I'm going to turn it on. Now, this is the eyes object. I'm going to copy move forward to here and paste. So just beyond where I pasted previously. So it's going to start pasting here and here. Sorry if you can hear lawn mowers outside. I'm just a little bit slow. And uh, they started mowing lawns. There we go. But we're just about done. OK, so with all of those clips, that's it. That's all you have to do once you've edited the three clips. I should be able to hit play and see the three of them play. So here we are at my slow, blending to fast, right? And now, did that work? I think it's blending. Oh, it does work, but the speed is a little bit too high. In fact, I could probably see the transition happening if I open the animator. I might have to alter the speed value just a little bit before handing it off to you. But you can sort of see it playing. Oh, there it goes. It's going in a big way. So it's a little glitchy, but we'll be able to verify the three of them, even if it doesn't play back like this. I'll just open the animation, uh, the animation panel and play back your animations. OK, so as a reminder, don't do exactly what I did necessarily. You can use the techniques that I showed, um, use the thought process that I showed. Just animate those three clips and then export the package and you're all set. And we'll have fun previewing everybody's funny animations. All right. Thank you, guys. And I'll see you in the next one.